to Umar uh, again. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil um, And so uh, Dr. Umar has actually been having some interesting experiences because, you know, he lives in Thailand, but he's uh, stuck in uh, Japan and they won't let him travel till he has insurance, which means money. OK, mm -hmm. he has you have to get insurance means and, you know, many people will not be able to produce this insurance paperwork at all. Yes. Yes, we're, we're headed for a, uh, to a multi levered, uh, a multi layered uh, tiered society. Mm -hmm. They want to herd everybody into the cities um, for easy control. And uh, oh, that is such an important point you just made. Yes, they want to hurt everybody to force them into the cities. That's right. That's right. That's what they want. Uh, China has, for example, China has several of these large metropolitan centers now. They're all ready to go. They're geared up for this new uh, Internet world and, uh, you know, the Internet of Things. Everything is wired, 5G, 6G, everything. And um, they're empty. The cities are sitting empty. They're waiting for the herds to come in, you see. Mm -hmm. they want They want to control absolutely everything. This is what a tyrant wants because they live in fear. The Jews are living in fear. They live in constant fear. Mm -hmm. And so anyone who lives in constant fear, for example, the uh, male chauvinist Muslim husband, mm -hmm. he has to terrorize his wife, his family, mm -hmm. because he's living in fear of them. He, but what he's really living in is fear of his own self, his own mm -hmm. loss of inner autonomy, his loss of peace. Mm -hmm. He has lost Islam, and but is uh, not able to confront that loss because Islam is peace. It is the mm -hmm. inner, uh, the inner expression of this peace. So people who are tyrants, they lose this. They lose this, and then they have to become tyrant. So they then become control freaks, and they want to control everything. You have just I, added a new dimension to a verse of the Quran that's repeated over and over again. La khawfun alayhim wa lahum yahzanun. They don't have any sadness or regrets, and they don't have any fear. This is yes. Allah's description of the believers. So, you know, usually yes. in tafsir, when in the interpretation of the Quran, when we read that verse, mm -hmm. we get two dimensions. One is mm -hmm. uh, regret of the past, fear of the future. Uh, and the other is, you know, that if you really believe, you will not be in a state of fear. But over correct. here, you've added a new dimension, which is mm -hmm. that when you are in a state of fear, you become a tyrant. Yes, yes. You become a tyrant because you fear the loss of control. And this loss of control is actually the expression of our submission to Allah, you see. Mm -hmm. In other words, he's the king. He is in control. The non-believer cannot do that. You mm -hmm. see, so they're living in constant fear, a constant state of tension. They cannot relax. They do not have this peace that Isa said, I leave my peace with you. Hmm. Now, wait here, because the Comforter is coming, and he will establish his peace as the kingdom of heaven that is <laughs> promised to Ibrahim, you see. And that was the whole point of uh, Islam. And then this kingdom was meant to spread throughout the world, not as an Arabic dominion, <laughs> hmm. but, but uh, you know, if I, as I told you repeatedly, if I One introduce of the great, you, uh, scholars uh, uh, Muhammad Iqbal calls it Arab imperialism. Yes, it's Arab imperialism. That's what it is, because these are people who have lost their Islam, and so they must become tyrants. And uh, the tyrant is the religious bigot who uh, is too concerned about how you pray rather than the quality of your life. Okay. Yes. And uh, this is uh, this is religious bigotry. This is religious tyranny, and this has um, this this has prevented the ummah from realizing tawhid and living this tawhid, so that their Islam is relevant. You see, mm -hmm. and this is what you're confronted with as you confront now the young uh, men, the young women. They want relevance. They, they want relevance. Okay, they need it. 
it is uh, it, 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 it is spiritual food, you see. Mm. It wow. is spiritual food, and the, the, the Ummah is starving for this. This is why uh, some people, not all, some people are interested in talk like me, because we have, uh, I have been set free of this religious bigotry, you see. Mm -hmm. It's not in me. It's you're, not not part part of the, you're not part of the institutions, in no. the institutionalized uh, uh, well, I'm not, I remember uh, when I was uh, about to graduate uh, from Azhar, mm -hmm. uh, which is a university in Egypt, I'm sure you know. Um, yes, I know. And, you know and, and, and so, you know, I'm sitting with my friends and we're talking about, okay, we're going to finish and what are we going to do? And that's when, you know, when I reflect back, it became so clear to me that this is an industry in itself because one of the kids is like, well, my father has, you know, a madrasa back home mm -hmm. and uh, and when i go back i'll just take over his school right yes. mm -hmm. and then another person said oh you know it'd be great if i can become an imam in america and then asking me can you get me citizenship i'm sure you've been asked so many times how can i get to america <laughs> yeah. yes I, i've how can been I get asked citizenship to america I'm, you know i was like young so i was like okay whatever um and then uh and then you know everybody's talking about what they will do in terms of career, right? Mm -hmm. so, right what is the career? And uh, whereas my teachers, like mm -hmm. they always told, told me, don't make Islam your career. Go do your whatever, you know, um, and, and, and then you do your Juma khutbas and stuff on the side, you know, you mm -hmm. get the help, but don't yes. make it your career. Don't become part of the industry, so to say. Yes, yes. And, uh, and so one benefit you have is you've been looking at Islam from a bird's eye view, way mm. up, and you're not part of the industry. <laughs> yes, I'm not. Uh, one of the, uh, the commentator, a, a, um, an African man, I forget which country, but he was a, a visiting scholar at um, Istak. He wrote an introduction to my uh, my book called Cain's Creed, mm -hmm. and he said that um, uh, I have a unique position as an insider and an outsider. Mm -hmm. See, and that allows me to to bring these streams together to help others to bring these streams of knowledge and experience together. You know, the the overall perception that is missing. Right. The bird's eye view. Uh, also, the, a bird's eye view. But also, you see, as a, um, I, I guess I'm what they call the, the baby boomer, uh, a baby boomer. And we were one of the last of the generations to have the best of whatever was left of a good education mm. in the public system, you see. Mm. So that, for example, when I went to high school and I graduated in 1967, they were still offering courses in Latin, you see. Uh, so not that I enjoyed it, but uh, got, I got very little out of it. But it was there. These classical, um, uh, it, that classical component to the education was there. But now it's gone. It's mm -hmm. absolutely gone. Uh, so um, yeah, it's gone. We're we're now being herded into the cities, and this whole COVID thing is part of that. Um, uh, the cowboys are, you know, just whipping everything up and getting us into into order and corralling us and going to put us all in the cities, all except those who've already left for the mountains, okay, like the prophet and also what Isa said. Isa said the same thing. He said, when you see these things, go to the mountains. Mm -hmm. Go to the mountains, okay. Fortunately, for some I had already done that, you see. Then I came to Islam and I lost everything that I did because I saw all this coming 25 years ago. Mm. I built a home and a farm in the mountains, in the mountain jungles, in the rainforest of Borneo. Mm -hmm. Okay. Just a few kilometers from the Indonesian border in, um, in East um, in Malaysia. I married a local native lady. Mm who happened to be a Christian, but these were tribal people who had lived there for several hundred, if not thousands of years. Mm. She was the native Dayak 
and a Christian missionary. I was a Christian missionary and a doctor at the time, but I took my life savings. I put it into this mountain farm. We farmed our own rice. We had our own chicken stocks, all that sort of thing. And then I came to Islam and I lost it all because I joined the traditional enemy of her people. I joined the enemy tribe by becoming a Muslim. I had no idea about this. You see, mm -hmm. I was a good husband. I was a good provider. I'd been good for her family, everything. All I did was become a Muslim, and that was the end of it. Mm -hmm. You see, uh -huh. her entire family asked me to leave, you see, after I had been so good to them. It didn't matter. I joined their enemy. So this, and this was not a religious thing. This was a cultural thing. It was a thing of war because the Muslims, the Malay Muslims in East Malaysia had raped and pillaged and murdered her people mm. for 500 years until the British Freemasons, James Brooke, came and put an end to it. Mm. So it took a Freemason to put an end to this injustice. Mm. And what we're talking about here in, in our conversations is the lack of this deen, mm. the lack of the correct deen. It has everything to do with male leadership. Mm. Okay. This same male leadership made the mistake of Arab imperialism, Borneo imperialism by the Muslim uh, 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 king. It's all mm. the same. They were so oppressed. My wife's people, my ex-wife's people were so oppressed that I joined the enemy. I joined the enemy tribe when I became a Muslim. I had no idea about this. I had to research it later to find out why the reaction was so virulent. Mm. I had no idea. So what we're discussing in our conversations is this aspect of the Ummah that the Ummah refuses to talk about. Mm. They refuse to talk about. I bring this, I brought this up to uh, the Malays in many conversations, and they don't want to know, okay? Mm -hmm. And they, it, it, when they find out, they don't want to do anything about it, you mm. see. What I discovered, for example, uh, when I was there, and I lived in Malaysia for quite some time, uh, uh, the better part of 15 years, I never once heard anybody from another country speak anything good about the Malays. Never once. Mm. Never heard a compliment of them. Never heard a good compliment or a good characteristic oh, the Malays are this, the Malays are that, 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 that. No, everybody hates Everybody I talked to from another country or even from their own Malaysian citizens who were non-Malay and non-Muslims hated them. Yeah. Because of their arrogance, okay, because of their arrogance, because of their pride, and because of their tyranny. Mm. Okay. Yeah, we're not and, talking about misinformation or something hearing on TV no. and then their minds changed. This is through experience and interaction that they're Yes, feeling. yes, yes. And so uh, this, is a, this is a problem, and this is exacerbated now since, you, you, you know this, how, how bad it is now, post-911. That whole thing was, it was not, the incident was not a farce, but the use of it, you mm. see, was a farce. The Muslims did not do that. The Jews did this. Everybody knows that Israel Everybody did this. <laughs> yeah. Everybody. But I went to... I'm at the top graduate school, okay, as an academic fellow in a, a Muslim institution, a Muslim nation, supposedly. And five years after the event, there's still the Muslims themselves are blaming the Muslims. The Muslims, a Muslim alim, are still blaming the Muslims in spite of all the evidence to the contrary. <laughs> so, yeah. what does this tell you? This is a form of blindness. Okay, mm. it's a form of blindness that runs very, very deep. And if your leaders cannot accept the truth and express the truth and walk with it, okay, and then act accordingly, <laughs> what hope is there for your young men who are looking for the Salahuddin's? Yeah, exactly. They're not, they're not going to find them. Yeah. And if they do find someone who is of that stature, he's going to be 
pro he's going to be prosecuting the wrong approach to jihad, you see, and they will follow him and they'll follow him right into the hellfire. So, and that's, so that's what you have with ISIS. And believe me, the Jews know this. <laughs> the Jews I'm talking to you about, and I mentioned yesterday in my uh, uh, comments about those who stand behind the black sun, okay, mm -hmm. yeah. they understand these things. They know these things, and they are playing the Ummah like a fiddle, okay? Mm -hmm. They're playing them like a fiddle, and your leaders, you know, are just w going along with them. They're following the bouncing ball. Mm. They're, they're like a rabbit or a, a dog at the hound track, going after the carrot or the rabbit. It's just, I, I'm just amazed. I sit here and I say, oh, my God, where is the thoughtful person? Where are they? Mm. You know? Then you have someone, for God's sake, God bless him, like Imran Hussein, trying to make friends with uh, Putin and his people. <laughs> These are the enemies of mankind. Mm. All right? Putin is a Jew. Mm. <laughs> He's surrounded by Jews. Trump is a Jew. They're surrounded by Jews. And they're mm. all surrounded by these Kabbalist Jews who are playing the world like like a ping pong table. That's what's take. It's a ping pong game for them. They, and they know. They, they follow chaos theory. They know they follow game theory. They know what the outcomes are going to be. Yeah. And, you know, and you, you have people like, what, what, what is this Imran Khan being president in Pakistan? What is that <laughs> all about? My God, the man is a football player. He's played games for a living. Okay. This is not a, a noble soul. This is not somebody who deserves to be in a position of leadership. This is somebody who's playing the game according to what these Kabbalists want. Mm. And this kind of leadership, the young men look at this and they either get lost in the, the football mania, which is stupid to begin with, okay? This has nothing to do with reality other than what the Jews want you to focus on. That's mm. what they want, and it's a moneymaker. So yeah, I, and, I, I, and, I, you know, I, since, you mentioned Imran to, Khan, since you mentioned Imran Khan, I'll mention two other things. Mm. One is that, you know, he, he came with this very high expectation of people, right? Like, mm. kind of like the hero. And now, uh, after all these years of corruption, so he's there to remove the corruption, but it's like that whole uh, expectation, hope, mm -hmm. hope, you know, it gets hope. cut into pieces. It's false that, hope. Yeah, false hope. And, 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 and it, it hurts the society in the long run even more because people mm -hmm. become more depressed and don't feel like they can, you know, they just accept uh, destiny, uh, I guess is the word for it, what it, it is, for what they... It's fatalism. It's programmed hopelessness. Fatalism. That's the word. It's yes. programmed hopelessness, and it 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 removes um, innovation. It removes the spirit of innovation. It removes motivation, and people just become uh, sort of hapless, and they accept the mundane, and they throw up their hands and say, "Oh, this is just the way it is. What can we do?" That's right. Yeah. What can we do? Uh, uh, they're coming with the needles. They're coming. They're coming. They're coming. Well, who is this day? It's your neighbors. It's your relatives. They're the ones in uniform who are enforcing this nonsense. Okay. They're the ones who are actually doing it. So um, this is a situation where uh, how can how can we restore uh the essence of the dean when mm. the entire society is being misled and misguided like this you mm. see it's very difficult and if not impossible this is why the prophet said go live like the bedouin mm. okay for an example i was just asked by somebody uh, uh not too long ago uh I'm in America, where can I go, da, da, da. I said, look, your best hope is not with the Ummah. 
because they're following after the uh, the, the Jews. Uh, they've got they've fallen right into the they're going right into the lizard's hole. Yeah. I said, no, your your best your best uh, uh, advice is to go with the Native American because they are the Bedouin of the Americans of the Americas. OK, they are the Bedouins and most of them, most of their tribes are true monotheist. They mm. don't pray to false deities. They pray mm. to Wakantaka, the great spirit. They call him the great spirit. Mm. OK, uh, in the, 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 the Sioux and they had their own prophets and they, they try to follow as best they can. I knew, for example, uh, uh, Russell Means. I didn't know him personally, but I can I, ha I had um, uh, contact with his uh, uh, his wife Pearl, and I had invited them to come to Malaysia to share with the uh, Malay uh, people there their experience in actually going against the system and establishing their own nation within mm. the nation because that's yeah. what they did. Yeah. They have their own nation, they have their own currency, they have their own banks, da 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 da. It's not a it's not a big, you know, uh, uh, success of the enterprise, but at least it's there. They've done something, you see, and they know why they did it, you see. They actually know why they did it, mm. you see, and they understand the enemy. They understand the enemy of the entire human race better than the Uma does. Mm. Better yeah. than the do. So I invited them. I wanted them to come and share their experience. Yeah. And I, I couldn't convince the Ulema to finance it, you see, oh. to finance or to, to, uh, to, to do it. So I had, we had to cancel it. But my advice to people in America, if you want to uh, get away from this nonsense, because it is hopeless, I'm mm -hmm. sorry. If it wasn't hopeless, the prophet would never have given that advice. So since since we are talking about that, uh, there are yes. two options that my community here is thinking about. Yes. One is the one that you mentioned. We have some people who have become Muslim in the reservations nearby. Uh, yes. So one option is to form some sort of alliance with them. Yes and to find a lot land near where they are. Yes. The other option is to find our own land uh, with some sort of, which is not, mountainous land is very cheap actually here in the US. And uh, uh, yes. yeah, ma because no who wants to buy a land that has mountains on it, <laughs> you <Yes>. know? <laughs> so well, it's, it's wild, okay. and. Yeah. The, the what we mean by that when we say wild, it's not really wild. It just appears wild. It's in divine order, and all you have to do is move in and and become the caliph because you've been given that that uh, responsibility as human beings. We have that authority. We have that ability, and with with Allah, Allah's guide, guidance, we can do it. But you can't do that if you don't have any experience at it. So. Mm -hmm. You go and live like the Bedouin, which means go and live with the Bedouin, which is what I've done in Thailand, you see, mm -hmm. because I'm up on a mountain plateau amongst native Thai people who are all local farmers and huntsmen and herders. And they, this is their country. They know it like the back of their hand. OK, mm -hmm. so I am there as their guest with married to one of their women who was highly regarded. My wife was a highly regarded school teacher, which in Thailand is a great honor Okay, mm -hmm. uh, to be in charge of instructing the children. So wherever she goes, even to this day, she has she has now uh, ex students who become police chiefs, <laughs> mm -hmm. so, right. and they and they actually bow to her in the street <laughs> when they see her coming down uh, because of this respect. So I'm her husband, you see. Mm -hmm. So they watch me very carefully, and this is part of my uh, my 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 job as a Muslim is to not terrify them. Mm -hmm. And to leave a good taste in their mouth, because uh, after I'm gone, they're, most of them don't know. But after I'm gone, they're going to find out. Oh, this man was a Muslim. Wow. Mm -hmm. You mean there are good Muslims? Wow. <laughs> we didn't know. 
Right. Uh, so, but getting back to your situation, you see what I've done, and I didn't do this. God did it for me. Mm. I was too busy trying to learn, trying to write. I had no time to arrange my personal affairs in this manner. I lost everything, you see, when I became a Muslim. So I just gave it up. I said, okay, if I'm going to lose everything that I did, and I conscientiously did, to go and live like, uh, uh, to go and do what Jesus said, go live in the mountains, okay, I did that, and then I lost it all because I became a Muslim. I said, okay, Allah, I'm, I'm not making any more plans. Allah <laughs> made the plan for me. You understand what I'm saying? Yes. I'm Allah sure. made the plan for me, and uh, so it's not the ideal uh, in certain sense, but in another sense it is. My house is right next to a Buddhist temple. Hmm. When I get up in the morning to do my prayer, I hear the monks doing theirs. Mm. I hear them chanting. Mm. I hear their little bells, you know, all this sort of thing. Right. Right. But never in my life have, ha have I had such peace to pursue mm. uh, my studies and my writing. I'm writing a novel. Mm. It's a writer's paradise. Okay. Mm. So uh, I didn't arrange any of this. Okay. Allah did. So that when I retired, I had my heart attack. I didn't even know about my wife's insurance. She mm. never told me until I needed it. <laughs> mm. And then I had my heart attack. I needed to bypass surgery. And there it was, all mm. prepared for me. Mm. I said, oh, my God, Allah, Masha, Allah, who could have arranged this, you see? Mm. So when you're making this kind of a plan, you have to give it over to Allah. Mm. You have to think about it. Yeah. You have to ask for Allah's guidance and then mm. go about your business. Mm. And you have to watch it very carefully what is within your reach. And then if it's given within your reach, you take advantage of it. Mm. So you say, uh, you've just said, okay, well, we have some new converts. They're Native Americans. That makes them within your reach. Mm. Yes. Sure. See? That places them within your reach. So that means you can explore the possibility. That's right. Once I found out that this possibility was within my reach, I explored it. Mm. And when I explored it and I found out what the circumstances were, I said, wow, Allah has made this clear for me. So all I had to do was walk the path. Mm. You see. I didn't have to make the plans. I didn't have to make all of the arrangements. It was already there. I just had to walk into the mountain. See, everything was waiting for me. So uh, it's probably a similar situation for uh, a person such as yourself and uh, those associated with you and yeah. who are thinking about what they can do. I mean, because we are actually uh, people that are around me in the masjid here uh, uh, in, in our area. Uh, we, we are we've had serious conversations about, you know, mm -hmm. we need to quickly within we're thinking within, you know, as soon as possible, really. Uh, yes, as soon as possible. And start making the, the shift. Mm -hmm. um, but I want to bring our conversation to a circle. I want to go back to two things that you mentioned in the beginning. Uh, one, we, we were talking about your overall view uh, mm -hmm. of Islam versus uh, being on the ground or being institutionalized. You know, and yes. you mentioned this before in one of our talks also, that you appreciated uh, Sheikh Imran Hussain giving the example of Majma al-Bahraini, where the two oceans meet. Yes, yes. But uh, in, in terms of Islamic authorities in our tradition, meaning the Islamic mm -hmm. tradition, Imam Ghazali uses an interesting word for this. Uh -huh. Exactly. And the reason that came to my mind is because you said exactly what he said. Oh. Imam Ghazali said, there is, he, 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 he coined this term called Dalhiz, mm -hmm. which is mm -hmm. a, a, word, a Persian word, not an Arabic word. And Dalhiz mm -hmm. is basically the door that's in your house, but it's outside your house. Yes, it's like the you know. So there's like this. Uh, there's the outside door. Then there's the mm -hmm. dalhiz. Then there's the inside door. Yes. So dalhiz yes, is the yes. person who's standing 
and he can see both the outside and the inside. Mm -hmm. And Imam Ghazali cons considered himself and he considered any authentic scholar to have authentic scholarship. He said, you have to be in a place of Dalhiz. Mm -hmm. You have to be able mm -hmm. to see the outside and you have to be able to see the inside. The problem yes. is that the ulama are not able to see the outside. They're only able to see the inside. And so this is why Imam Ghazali was able to write Tahafatul Philosophy. He was able to write about the philosophers of his time and before and shred them into pieces in some some <laughs> ways you can say. Yes. Right? Yes. And and so that is the importance of people like you is that you are a person who is really in Dalhiz at many levels, from the level of coming into Islam, from the level of looking at the previous books of Allah versus the tradition of Islam, meaning the Quran and the sayings of the Prophet Muhammad and the early generations. And so you're, you're in Dalhiz at many different levels. And that is, I think, uh, one of the great advantages of you. And you understand this world and you're able to grapple with issues like marriage, issues like political issues. And I think that's uh, a rare gift, really. Uh, so I hope, inshallah, Allah really spreads your works all over the world uh, to, you know, at least all the Muslim intellectuals. Uh, well. they, and the second point you made yeah. that I want to make the whole circle around is you mentioned China having cities huh. that are empty and they're ready to go, uh, ready yeah. to bring people into these cities. In that you made... Uh, two points, but I wanted to share something with you that you might find interesting in terms mm -hmm. of, because it seems to me that they're looking to China in terms of the future social network or networking. Yes, they are. And, they and are. the thing is that, you know, in the U.S., uh, the way we have our FICO, our, uh, you know, how well we do in doing our payments and we have mm -hmm. our credit score. Mm -hmm. But it seems mm -hmm. like in China, they also have a social score. Yes, yes where the cameras are looking at you and they'll say, okay, this person is normal. He goes to the bars, you know, he buys normal things. He, and then this person is not normal because he doesn't go to the bars. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and he spends too much time in that mosque, right? Yes. Yeah. Especially from a communist yeah. perspective, that's like completely makes no sense to them. <laughs> like you're not being very productive. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this person in Ramadan doesn't buy any food. And if you know China, why I'm referring to that. So they have these cameras that are like grading you socially, how like normal you are. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, yeah. and then if they have a system like that on us, especially the Muslims, especially the practicing Muslims, now mm -hmm. that they have, uh, you know, made Muslims look like terrorists, backwards, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And and now they put these social cameras on. They're going to be giving us a social grade. Mm -hmm. uh, well, we're in a, going to be in a terrible situation if we're in the city. Well, they, yes, this is what they're doing. What uh, many people do not understand: uh, China is not the enemy uh, in 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 the traditional sense. The, the answer is yes and no. China has become the model, okay? Now, be, before you go to China, first to go visit Singapore. And Singapore, of course, was a, a very favorable uh, social experiment. Mm -hmm. And it's one of the most successful. Singapore is, com is a little city-state, if you will. It's not, you can call it a country, but it's just a big island. And uh, in the scheme of things, it's very small, but it carries an awful lot of financial weight because of its positioning uh, mm -hmm. in the uh, uh, straits, the Malacca Straits and all the shipping, everything that goes through there. It's predominantly Chinese, uh, but it was Chinese guided by the people who guided uh, the whole world into this commonwealth system. The commonwealth, if you will, the commonwealth is the largest corporation that has ever existed in the history of mankind. Mm -hmm. They like to ha let people believe that the uh, British uh, commonwealth, the British empire fell. 
But no, it didn't really fall. It was transformed into this Commonwealth because the Commonwealth is still controlled by the elitist in Britain. And most of these elitists, there may be some old families left, but they're most intermarried with the Jewish class that I spoke of before from this Illuminati uh, triad, triad that uh, uh, came together 300 years ago. 400 years ago through the then they established the Dutch and the East Indies companies and they're still ruling the world. This small group of people, these 200 families are ruled by another 30 families and then there's a 13 families above the 30. Mm. Okay. And then you see these are the people who are actually ruling the world. They say who gets noticed and who doesn't get noticed. Right. They determine who's going to make the law. They determine which rebellions are going to succeed and which ones are going to be put down. They decide, and they are the untouchables. The, the Secret Service actually calls them the Olympians. Okay, mm. This is a, one of their passwords. Okay, So these people are still ruling the world. And China as uh, J John D. Rockefeller recently said about a generation ago now, or one of the Rockefellers, I forget which one, he said, they're our most successful experiment, mm -hmm. okay? Now, I've been following China, following China since uh, I was young, in this eighth grade. I wrote my first political science paper on the fact that the United States handed China to Mao Zedong. Mm -hmm. And I question why. I was 12 years old at the time. Wow. I wanted, I wanted to know why, you see. <laughs> so I, I have been looking at this thing for a long time. <laughs> wow. A long time. That was nearly 50 years ago. Okay. China is their most ex ex uh, successful experiment. But first they did Singapore. You see, first they established Singapore. Singapore is the epitome of the uh, New World Order city state. You know, this state where you, you, you saw, if you watch, watch this movie called Hunger Games, did you ever see that? Yeah, I think so, yes. 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 Singapore is the city, okay? Mm -hmm. And what they're pushing for is for the whole world to become like Singapore. Okay, and they're, they're, so they established a model in Singapore. It's a working model, and they used it. The Freemasons run Singapore, okay, and Freemasonry is run by the Jews and by the Jesuits. So they're all there, okay. There's nothing that doesn't happen there that isn't under their thumb. And, you know, they, people want to know about Mahathir. You know, all his money is in Singapore, in the Jewish banks. <laughs> okay, and and it, but he makes a big noise about speaking about Zionists, you see, mm. but he hands them his money, you see, you, you, you uh, please, somebody reconcile this, and he's a Muslim <laughs> leader, okay, somebody please, uh, never mind, you want, you get the picture, so China, getting back to China, China is now being turned into Singapore, but on a large scale. So mm. they, they did the, 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 the small model. You understand the industrial process. They did the small model, which is Singapore, and now they're going to mass produce it. Right. And so they're getting ready. That's what these cities are all about. They're built, they're ready. They're going to herd everybody in from the, uh, the farmlands, from the, from the rural regions, because they don't want... Uh, banditos out there, <laughs> okay? They don't want guerrilla forces out there. Yeah. And they they want will be natural farming, right? Everything is becoming yeah. uh, yeah. technology-based. Everything is becoming, you know, it's so interesting. I, when this whole coronavirus thing happened, one of the things I did is I went to the store and bought all the seeds I could. Yes, oh, good for you. But lo and behold, mm. Some of those seeds don't produce seeds. Yes. Yeah, they're all hybrids already. <laughs> they're hybrids. <laughs> yes. And I didn't the Native American the Native American five hundred dollars for seeds and I end up realizing that about two hundred dollars of that was a waste of money, really. Yes. 
some of the Native Americans still have the real seeds, and some of you organic farmers still have the real seeds. Okay, so that's you a problem out, that needs to be done. We need to get you the find seeds. out who's got the yeah. You find out who's got the seeds, the real seeds. Okay, these this is viable. Everything that they're selling in the shops now, some sort of hybrid. It's been genetically modified, or it's been biologically watered down. The potency is gone. Okay, and that's what they want. They want to uh, demasculinize the entire world. They're they're gelding all the population. They're gelding the men. The men are psychologically gelded now. Mm -hmm. That's why they're saying yes, sir, yes, mm -hmm. sir, yes, sir. There was a time when you know a man would st would stand up to his uh, commanding officer and say, "Not on your life," and throw down the gauntlet. Okay, mm -hmm. those days are gone. OK, mm -hmm. there are very few men worth their soul now who will do that. OK, so as I said, this is hopeless. The situation is hopeless. If you want to play this game, go ahead and play it because it is a game and they understand game theory far better than you do, mm -hmm. but not better than Allah does. OK, right. so if you want to. Uh, do what is correct, you have to do what the prophet said. You are, it has, you, there's no way around it. That's right. There's no way around it. There's no way around it. He made it very clear. And now I'm trying to make it as clear as possible. Yes, it is hopeless. H-O-P-E-L-E-S-S. -E -E mm. You don't stand a chance against this system. This diagetic system, you do not have stand a chance. So go and live like the Bedouin. Go live with the Bedouin because they know how to do it. And don't worry about their religious values. That's not important. Mm. Because what you just said about Al-Ghazali, one of the doors is inward. Okay, mm. This is where you carry your Islam. It doesn't have to be out there in the street. You carry it in here. What you carry it into the street is sometimes you have to practice uh, what they call, um, uh, you have to hide your Islam, as you will. Because now people find it offensive, and they find it offensive because, in fact, it has been offensive, mm. okay? Because it hasn't been living according to, and practiced according to the deen. And this is for quite some time now. It's not recent, it's been going on for quite some time, mm -hmm. okay? Not just since 9-11, but prior to 9-11, okay? You know, I, don't, I, I hear all these people, they say, oh, what about the Muslims and the Jews living side by side in peace in Palestine? Yes, all of that was very nice, but these Jews were the still, still the same ones, practicing the Kabbalah, understanding everything about the black sun until it was time to make the move. Hmm. Okay, and when the move was made, they stayed behind with the Jews, did they not? Of course yeah. they did. Yeah, yeah, and very few of them reached out and helped the Palestinians. Yes. They turned their backs on them. Matter of fact, they turned against them. Probably even picked up the rifle. Okay, so forget all that romantic nonsense. It's not true. Okay, this Islam has not been according to the Dean. For a long time now. That's, uh, that's another very, about. very good uh, point you make is that we have a very romanticized yes. view of Islam. Oh, yes, I can't tell you how many times I've walked out of a conference on the Golden Age. <laughs> I'm so sick of hearing <laughs> that. I'm so sick of it. Oh, my God. Please don't even bring it up because you're liable to get me angry again like I yeah, was I mean, just Because, you know, <laughs> Spain wasn't as beautiful as we sometimes talk about Spain being yes, so great. No. Or nor were the there Ottomans never... great as, as we make the Ottomans no. look great. You know, never. It was only just the early first period. Yeah. And then, inshallah, what will come with Isa, alayhi salatu wasalam, like the Prophet said, the beginning and the, la the ending of the reign. The beginning and the ending. So there's nothing can be done until uh, Isa returns, okay? And when Isa returns and you really see and they make it clear, there will be a group of uh, ulema and we don't know who they are, but they will suddenly appear and they will recognize him, okay? 
And when they recognize him and they, they say, like John the Baptist said, this is the man, okay? This is the one you're, you've been waiting for, okay? He's the one. He's the one who's anointed. Well, let's just talk about that, uh, this idea. It's a Christian concept, but it's also a Jewish concept, and it's an Islamic concept. Anointed means appointed, okay? Yeah. It means divinely appointed, all right, to be the caliph, to be the khalifa, to be the one who's the leading the jihad, okay? If you don't have this individual, don't go, don't do it. Don't, you'll just be adding to the chaos. But when this individual arrives, because he's been appointed and you follow him, then you follow in under divine order, then the dean is correct. Yes. And that's when, if he throws, Allah will throw with him. Okay? That's what happens. If it's not in divine order, Allah does not throw. But the jinn are going to throw everything they possibly can at you, and including your brother's weapon against you. Mm -hmm. And that's what, what's happening now. And Muslims don't seem to comprehend this. This is spiritual principle. It's way, way above Sharia. It's yeah. far above. It's as high above, high above Sharia as Everest is above the Dead Sea. Mm -hmm. Okay? It's, you know, these are spiritual principles. This, these are the, uh, you know, Islam has not worked out its moral system. It is not, it's been abandoned for religious, you know, nonsense. The moral system is what is in Islam, and this is the difference between what is good and what is bad, what is justifiable and what is not justifiable. And these are all moral principles and ethics which have to be put into practice. And if they are not defined according to spiritual principles, then all is lost. Of all you're looking at is the legalism in some book of Makassid uh, Sharia, you, you've, lost this, you've lost a game before mm -hmm. you've even started to play. You, before you move your first pawn, you, it's already lost. Because this, these moral principles of the divine order are not understood. They're just not understood. Yeah, it's I, like looking I, at the leaf or the tree in a forest uh, and not look at the forest, right? <laughs> Yes. yes, everything is tawhid, everything is connected, and everything is according to the deen. So when you have this enemy who's been given dominion because you failed to practice the deen, okay, yes. Yes. the first thing to do is to repent. And you can't repent until you recognize that that was your failure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I made this failure. We committed this sin as an umba, and we're still committing it, okay? Mm -hmm. It's like I said yesterday, you go to the masjid on Juma and you sit there and hear a khutbah from a man who's buggering your boys. Mm -hmm. Please, let's get this correct, okay? This needs to be corrected before you do anything. I don't want to talk to people who don't want to face up to correcting this because it's a waste of time. Yeah. It is a waste of time, my brother. And because it's a waste of time and because the whole mindset is given over to this kind of religious thinking, this vain piety, this stupidness, it's stupidity. Muslims are breeding stupidity. Mm -hmm. They're breeding moral stupidity. Okay. And there's no hope for such a system. Mm. So come out of it. Come out of it. The New yeah, Testament. There, there's, there's a, yeah, and, and uh, you know, so this romanticism is, yes. is a blinding force. Yes, it is a blinding force. And believe me, the Jews know how to romanticize things, okay? They created <laughs> Hollywood for this. <laughs> Yeah. And it is it is a spell. It it casts a spell. It casts a magic spell. So rather than facing the reality <coughs> on the ground, people are living in this romantic uh, imagination, and it's vain. Vain mm. is a form is a word that equates with idolatry. 
Mm. It equates with idolatry, the greatest of all crimes. The greatest of all crimes against heaven. Hello. So my, my advice, dear brother, is to explore these mountains that are within your reach, you see. If they're within your reach, that means there's something there for you. Yeah, absolutely. And you can't find out what it is until you take a real good look. Allah gives you the signpost, and then you don't find out what's there until you follow that signpost. You have to walk it. And then when you walk it and you get to the next signpost, you see what's there waiting for you. And this, I have lived this. I have lived this, and I know that it's true. Uh, so uh, people ask me all the time, what to do? What should I do? What should I do? And I give them the same advice because it works. It's mm -hmm. based on these same spiritual principles of guidance. So uh, we didn't get much into marriage today. <laughs> no, not into marriage. But I think we clarified something important about the type of model we're looking at in the future. Mm -hmm. And we also mm. clarified again, I know we talked about uh, the coming together of the type of knowledge that's needed in this time. Yes. And, uh, and uh, so I think those things were made very clear. And then you uh, made certain principles, pr spiritual principles, very clear. Mm. And uh, so I think that was good. I think it's important for people. I mean, some very key points you made, like, for example, you said they're going to try to take all the farmers and everybody into the cities. Yes. And that's very, very key to, to yeah. what's going to happen. And we have to go the opposite direction. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Uh, otherwise, you're going to be stuck there. And if you're stuck there, well, you just have to make the best of it. And you, you know, even if you're stuck in the city, you make the best of it. That's just the way it is. But don't pretend it's not what it isn't. <laughs> See, no, but see, what most else. people do is they'll do exactly what we've done uh, to our current situation, which is they will um, think this is the new normal, right? Uh, Even no. though it's abnormal, they'll think, okay, well, this is, like you said, <coughs> this is so we have this riba infested system, that <coughs> all the blessings away. And then now we will have a, something even worse and with more blessings taken away and people uh -huh. less inclined to have you'll be blinded because you'll be stuck, kind of. Yeah. You know? you'll be stuck, you'll be blinded. Some people will be there and they won't be blinded. There will be the, the odd individual who, who will actually stand his ground and then be killed on the spot as a, mm -hmm. uh, as a, as a, uh, a martyr. That, that's okay. If that's what your destiny is, then so be it, okay? Mm -hmm. Um, if you, if you can't, if Allah hasn't made any other path for you, for whatever reason, then that, that may well be your ticket to paradise. Okay. Mm -hmm. But don't just sit there and be passive and, uh, and then just accept these things. You know, when you're fighting a war, you have to, uh, measure before the battle, you have to measure what the possibilities are what the outcomes are and yeah. then you you, you decide uh, where the best battleground is uh, for you to make your last stand make your last stand <laughs> it may it, yeah. it, it it will come to that for some of you yes okay? for, for for some of us it will come to that you have to make your last stand and you know i i have this image of the the the, the native american chief or the, the Viking who takes his spear and shoves it into the ground, pulls out his sword and ties his uh, ankle to his spear and then says, OK, come, here I am. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, of course, they'll just shoot him down. But at least he's made his stand. Mm. OK, death is not the end. It's just a transition. People are afraid to confront this moment. They're afraid yeah. of it. OK. You have to overcome that fear, like the apostle said. He said, die before you die. Did he not? Yes. Of course. Die before you die. This, yep. there's, there's your key. So if you can't make it to the mountains, then die before you die. 
You, mm. you imagine this moment and then you wait for it to come. It will come. Mm. And if it doesn't come, it means that you've just surrendered. Okay. Right. And after you've surrendered uh, to this and you've uh, accepted the new abnormal, you know, you, you've lost your grace. There's no grace left. Yeah, and Dr. Omer, over, over here, I want to share with you a very, uh, I think, important point based upon this conversation we're having. You yes. said that what you're talking about is above Sharia. And over here, I want yes. to give a very good example. By Sharia, you specifically mean Islamic law, the fiqh. Yes, yes. The fiqh always will bend to the needs of the people because they have to live Islam. Yes. You yes. see it? You see, mm. I, I, I'll give you, uh, I can give you hundreds of examples, but mm. I'll give you positive and negative and all sorts of examples of this. But, you know, the, 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 the fiqh will always bend to what the people need because they have to live Islam. So it has to be bent to yes. so no matter what situation you're in, even if you have to mm. eat pork, the sharia will bend or the, the fiqh will bend for you yes. to... Yes. To be able to live an Islamic, uh, quote unquote, legal is legal Islam. So, yes. it's like one example of that could be uh, that you know uh, it, the 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 scholars of the past, okay, mm. the scholars of the past, they wouldn't have accepted, uh, a, or many of them would have not accepted the water we do wadu in, with with yes. the with the fluoride and the chloride and yes. all of the other yes. things that are mm. put into water. But we accept it because it's the only choice we have. Yes. That's what Islamic yes. Islamic law will always cater to the needs of the people. Yes. But the divine principles yes. is the to divine remain. Principles, they remain unchanged. So you can have a downfall of the Muslims while they're living Islam legally because it's been bent and mm. bent and bent and bent to the needs of the people. Yes. That they can, you know. But the when the but the divine principles are still bringing that nation down. Yes. And and the yes. divine principles, or uh, if, if they stand up and they bring the spirit back, then the divine principles will bring them back up. But yes. you know, our our problem is that fiqh is not the solution. The solution to our problems is not in fiqh. Of course, that's it. You've just said it. That's the nail on the head. The solutions are not there. The solutions are not in fit because fit will say, oh, well, it's durura, it's a necessity. Yes. <laughs> and then that necessity will, you know, like, for example, let's take this COVID uh, example. So mm -hmm. Islamic law came and adopted to the situation and said, OK, let's close the mosques. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that is something that would have been impossible. But that's what Islamic law does. Islamic law coesces to the needs of that time and the needs of the people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But you have to be able to see like khidr, not just the legalism. Yes. Where you can see beyond, wait, this is, you know, th there is something more more to this than what meets the yeah. eye. Yeah. And you have to understand that such a measure is only temporary, or it should be temporary, until you find the real solution. And the real solution may actually be to fight. You see, yes, <laughs> there may not be any other solution or the real solution may be hijra uh, until until the those moment. Are the only, those are the only fight. two options. Either you're going to yes. have to fight or make hijra. Yes. yes. You know, yes. and so exactly. I think we'll end here, but mm. I think it's very important because it's very hard for the average Muslim to understand the difference between Islamic legalism Mm. as a solution for Muslims. Mm. Because you can always have a, a group of scholars come together and give a fatwa, like you mentioned today, right yeah. now, gave the example of 9-11. Scholars coming together condemning 9-11, right? <laughs> so you can condemn 9-11, you can give the fatwa, but that fatwa is coerced to other agendas and other people's feelings. That's what Islam yes. does. Yes. Yes. Unless you don't know the broader principles, which the Quran calls the sunnahs of Allah. Lan tajida sunnah mm. Allah tabdila. Oh, the sunnah of Allah does not change. Does not, does change. not change. Those are the, if you don't keep the sunnahs of Allah in mind, which is the beauty of having you, 
Those of us that are scholars and lost in Islamic legalisms, we're going to miss the whole point if we yes. don't keep of Allah in mind. Yes. And so lost, I want, lost in legalism. That is a very good phrase. Yes. And, and I want people to understand what Dr. Omer is offering. What he is offering is he's offering you an insight that goes beyond legalisms. Yes. Good and beyond. he's offering yeah. you an insight based upon the sunnah of Allah. Mm. And he doesn't have to necessarily be an expert in Islamic legalism because a lot of the problems occur from there. Yes. The, <laughs> the, the, yes. Oh, my God. Such It's so refreshing to speak to uh, a young man like you who can actually perceive this. So few people can perceive this reality. Oh, my God. So, yeah, these are the doors in and the doors out. Oh, this is wonderful. We need to pursue this. Um, I have some, uh, I, I, I'm gearing up to make some videos on the principles of spiritual law. I've already written about some of these matters. It is nobody in Islam is talking about these things. And if they have in the past, these books have not been translated or they've been ignored. I'm sure I'm not the first individual to to see this. I'm sure I'm not the first individual to express this. But nobody I know is talking about these matters. And, what's and these are the is matters. The coming back of Jesus, Jesus represents the man who was against legal legalities, right? Yes. <laughs> yes. You know, yes. so, so he's, he's going to bring the spirit <laughs> into Islam again. Exactly. And he's probably going to be very annoyed with legalisms, honestly. Yes. Because yes. our scholars are no different from the Pharisees at the time of Jesus. And you can Indeed. see, even in the New Testament, when you see the questions being asked to Jesus, you can mm -hmm. see our scholars asking him the same type of questions. Yes. And, and but anyway, so uh, but yeah, I, I think it's very important to know that there's the Sunnah of Allah, which has to do with the uh, with has to do with the you can say the decline and the rise of the Ummah. Yes. Yes. Where Islamic law will always coerce. It doesn't matter if you're downtrodden; you still are going to pray, right? Mm -hmm. You might change how you pray. You might keep some distance from each other. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. You yeah. might change a few things, but you're still going to follow the legalities, but that's not going to necessarily determine the rise of the Ummah back again. That's like a whole different, no. that's a whole different field. No, no, it doesn't. That's a whole different, that's a whole different matter, a whole different field. The Sunnah of Allah and the Sunnah of Allah with his people, with his servants, is completely different uh, than uh, what people imagine it might be, or most people aren't even thinking about it, okay? They're just trying to uh, please their immediate environment, okay? They're trying to please the leaders that they have in the immediate environment. Mm -hmm. They're just trying to get along. They go along to get along, which means they're just obeying orders, which is the same thing that the Nazis did, is it not? Of course it is. Okay, this is far from the Sunnah of Allah. Mm. Yeah, and just one more example being... of this. You know, the scholars used, gave a fatwa at one time, it's haram to learn English. Oh. Then they coerced. <laughs> then they coerced because it was the needs of the people. They yeah. gave the fatwa, you cannot wear pants, uh -huh. right? Yes. But then they had to coerce. Mm -hmm. So they made a fatwa to take a stand, but fiqh will always bend to where the people are going. Yeah. And that's why fiqh does not offer a solution to the ummah as a whole, no. right? To it come out not. of the situation. It does not. No, it does not. The spiritual law is what offers the solution. Spiritual law is the deen. Yes. And the deen is above the fiqh. The fiqh is for... Um, it, the fiqh is for those who are not keeping the spiritual law. Yeah. <laughs> you can say okay. that. You can say that in a certain sense. Yeah. It, it's, a, it's for the people who, you know, 
they've gone to the candy shop with daddy and daddy has given it's, three it's like jelly beans Islamic finances so now we're yeah. in this ripa system and we make these new models and we say yeah. well legally it's okay so fine right yes. without looking at the holistic it's, it's not fine <laughs> of course it's not fine it's not fine Any, anyone with the sense of a brain will see that it's it's just it's uh playing with the laws of Allah in a sense yes right and yeah. And then the sad thing is that, you know, people want to get a home. So then anyway, that's a whole different issue. And, and, different and it's not even the point. The point is that how legalities sometimes even come to serve uh, the, will serve the wrong agendas. The legality will serve the enemy, the will cause of your enemy. enemy. That's what yes. happens. Because you're going to make the fatwa based upon when all the fatwas were given about 9-11. Who were they serving? Uh, Muhammad Abdul, the man who led Al-Hazar yeah. into the 20th century. He made Reba legal for his good friend, uh, Lord, uh, what was his name? Kurzan, or the uh, the, I've forgotten his name. The, the fellow who was the president of Bering Bank. They belonged to the, the same Freemasonic club, you see. Mm -hmm. They went to the same lodge. Muhammad Abdul made Reba legal in Egypt when he was the president or director of Al-Hazar. Yes. Okay. And I've never heard him rebuked about this. Okay. And you're a graduate of this system. Oh, by the grace of Allah, Allah has raised you above it. Alhamdulillah. 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 That's very, very good. Well, let's just make an end here. We we'll pick up again okay. tomorrow or the next yes, day, sir. whenever we, whenever uh, Allah leads us. Okay, dear brother. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Make sure to subscribe today and make sure you like and make sure you leave your comments and ideas. Zakumullah khairan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi Hello, Allah.